uh, let me introduce the panel for the discussion. Uh, the panel is uh, Anne Morrison Hudson, a ceramicist, Joan Early's niece and co-founder of Early 100. Jan Patience is an arts journalist and also co-founder of Early 100. Anna Carlyle and Alexandra Mathy, uh, Mathy are from Heroic Theatre Company and wrote the play Joan Early, A Private View, and Alexandra played Early in the original production, as well as voicing the excerpts of the play, including the Tabernacle film that I hope you're going to be able to see later, and I'm sure will be left up for a long time after today. Also delighted to welcome back Susanna and Jenny, and thanks so much for such a great paper. Um, just let's begin uh, with the question, um, Jan, to you first of all. Um, do you think, I mean, I, this is fantastic that this is happening, but do you think that the whole idea of early on Aaron is complete? Oh, Kirsty, I, I missed the second part of that question. I wonder, I mean, what we see, what we saw there in the papers and what we would have also seen in the Tabernacle film was that just how important the formative years in Aaron were and how they echoed through the later work, both in figurative and landscape. But I wonder if in the, in the Scottish imagination, Aaron has been very much overshadowed by Catterline hitherto. <clears throat> Definitely. I mean, it's really only with this work that everything is coming out about uh, Joan's uh, time in Aaron and you know her it's it's been written about in various biographies but it's maybe more a, a footnote more than uh you know the, the sort of importance of it and you know you can as as Jenny and Susanna uh, outlined there you can really see the way she was heading you know in these very free uh, drawings and paintings that she did in Aaron uh, you know they they predict the work that she would go on to do in Catalan, which you know, sort of everyone absolutely adores. Uh, you know, the seascapes, the sort of the the, the, the wonky line of the Catalan uh, cottages and so on. But you know, she was she was looking. She's always always looking, and that's what she was doing in Aaron. Um, Anne Morrison Hudson. I think you were a little girl uh, of ten uh, when Joan actually died. So your memories of her maybe mixed in with family memories. But when did you become aware, first of all, of her extraordinary talent? Well, we didn't have that many uh, paintings around the house uh, until after she died. But the one main one was given uh, to um, by Joan to, to her sister, my mother, um, as a wedding present. Um, and that was uh, of our broth to, to boats and our broth. So it was something that was always there. And, you know, we knew that, that she drew, and I think you don't realize how, I mean, she wasn't around much because she was always away painting. Um, but as Jan said, and, and the two papers we've just heard, the, the work in Aaron was very, very important. And I do think it has been um, not really given the significance that it, it, it should be because her landscape work in Aaron was, a, and also the drawings of, of the, 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 you know, the, the Jeannie and, and possibly Mrs. Kelso as well, were very important to the work she did when she went, uh, did her um, Italian uh, trip uh, scholarship. And that was, you know, I think it's underestimated about how important, and when you see those, the, those beautiful drawings that were shown, how competent they were for such early work straight out after, after um, art school. I want to bring in Heroica Theatre Company now because Anna, and you wrote the play about her, Alexander, you played Joe, and I saw a bit of that on YouTube, and my dear friend, the late uh, Marilyn Imry, uh, directed that. Um, Anne, when you wrote the play, uh, what was it that you were hoping to convey about Joan as a, a painter and as a person and as somebody who lived with depression? I, I didn't get the end of that question, Kirsty, but I got the beginning of it. So it, I'll ask it, answer from there. Yeah, I was just saying that you were somebody that also lived with depression her whole life. And obviously painting was, was everything to her. I think there are, there are two strands there, Kirsty. The first thing was, her difficulty in believing in herself was very strong in me. That sense that she was 
struggling against her own odds most of the time, her self-belief, and that even in the most inspirational settings, she still, and the film will, will illustrate this, that she wouldn't necessarily can believe in her own talent yet. It was evolving and it took a very long time for her to move through those phases to self-belief. So that when she was in Aaron, she was, you know, still at that very um, struggling stage and feeling not inspired by the landscape really in, to the extent that she was inspired by Margot herself. Yeah. And it was Margot who seemed to put her on the park, the actual uh, emphasizing the focuses. And we yeah. felt that spirit when we arrived in Aaron, and I'm not even sure that before we did on our first research trip, I'm not sure that before we did, I was even thinking of an Aaron dimension to the play. But then mm -hmm. after that experience, I knew how important it was to bring that in because that was a you know, part of the stage of her development as well. And Alexander, um, when deciding how you would play, you know, what Anne was writing, how much was that insecurity very important? I mean, I think you can really see how Sandy and G'd her up, even from just supporting her in Glasgow as well, but just G'd her up uh, uh, to be an artist. I think one of the wonderful things was that as we pursued Joan, who was the first person, you know, we saw her work and thought we must do something about this person. We got Margot sort of for free as the journey went on and their sort of, the, the sort of symbiosis that developed between them in terms of support, I think, was absolutely vital. Uh, and the fact that Joan went back and back to that place where that route obviously was in Margot giving her confidence, actually, to carry on. Um, I think that really, really helped just the energy that Joan had to paint was to get everything out of herself in, 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 with, with physical energy. And in approaching playing her, that was the thing I was most scared of not being able to convey was literally the sort of brutal force with which paint flew from her hand onto the canvas. And you, you want to sort of feel that distance between you and, and you her. Just that, you do that virtually in the play. You're not using paint, but you do those strokes with your arm so, so brilliantly. Uh, Jenny Brownrigg, it strikes me that, of course, the Sandyman um, and Airdy were coming to Aaron, knowing about the Jesse M. King E.A. Taylor tradition, knowing about High Corey, getting inspiration from that being a, a place of artistic endeavour, much like a Kubri for other artists and so forth. How much, if it hadn't been, do you think, for Jesse M. King, how much of this would actually have happened? I think that's something to maybe bring other um, uh, panel members or perhaps Susanna can answer that one about the the link with um uh high cory and the the summer school um uh i i must admit like i i've just got sucked <laughs> into the different um uh the the different drawings and analyzing the drawings and the paintings um uh so perhaps there's somebody better placed on the panel okay i'll, I'll hand that to Susanna Susanna um i think it was important in uh, Margaret Sandman's parents establishing an artistic network uh, and probably exhibiting the work. I'm sure that's probably how it works, as it, as it does with all artists. But I think that the connection with Corrie or Muriel Boyd um, was there anyway. I mean, her parents, I think, had been studying in Corrie uh, since the, the you know, very early decades of the uh, and uh, the holidays, sorry? Sorry, just yeah. somebody needs to mute now, we won't hear you. There we go. Carry on, Susanna. Yeah, I think, I think the connection was there. I think it obviously helped to foster a sense of community. It helped to foster um, a sense of um, peer support and peer kind of critique um, that um, Jesse M. King and E.A. Taylor had this, this summer school, probably led to lots of different networks and connections. But I think the connection with Corey was there as a holiday destination, as it was with um, Sky. So Edley's introduction to Aaron was definitely through Margot Sandman's family. Um, it was the first time she'd visited Aaron, um, and then it was this kind of regular feature in her life and in her painting. I think until the late 50s, possibly even 1960. And um, you and Jan have founded the Early 100 for the um, centenary of her birth. I'm not sure just how many people know much about what's planned. So tell me how, how 
all encompassing that's going to be in terms of the, the positions and the, the, the kind of work that's going to be shown and where it's going to be shown, Anne? Um, well, it's across Scotland and it's extending further than that. Um, uh, most of the places that have collections are doing something, there's some big exhibitions, um, and then also including uh, one of the, at least one of the, the commercial galleries, the Scottish Gallery, will we'll be having a, an exhibition during the uh, Edinburgh Festival or festival time. Uh, um, and it's, it, although there's no huge show, there's so many different things going on. It's, it's very exciting when I mean, the National Galleries have got a show starting. Um, all, all, a lot of them are all starting around the 18th of May, which is the actual um, 100th birthday of, for Joan. Um, and I think it's um, a, that's why we put this together so that people can go there and see what's on, so that hopefully there's somewhere near you that you can go and see some works. And if they're not available physically, then a lot of stuff is going online. Maybe Jan wants to say a little bit more there. Yeah, Jan, do you come in on that? <clears throat> yeah, there's uh, well, there's uh, an exhibition starting online from Aberdeen Art Gallery, which has got an amazing collection because a lot of work was gifted by the family. Uh, I think it's today actually, the Gracefield Art Centre in Dumfries is uh, starting their exhibition of work. And of course they have a collection of Audrey Walker's photographs. And Audrey Walker was a great friend of Joan Erdley and took a lot of photographs of her in their studio in Townhead and up in Catalan. So they have a, a great collection of Erdley work and also photographs. So that, that's now available. So yeah, I think if people keep an eye on the, the Joan Erdley website, and the social media, that's where you'll find out what's happening. Uh, it's, a, it's a real hive event, Kirsty. You couldn't have predicted this a year, a year ago. It's but amazing. Yeah. And Jan, you will remember this as well, and many other people presumably will too, is that um, there used to be an auction room in Cresswell Lane in the 70s and early 80s, uh, run by somebody called Jude, or at least that's what we called him. And I can remember Joan Airdley's tenement pictures being there and not raising the price. They could not get the price for them. It was shocking uh, just how uh, badly, in a way, Airdley was treated, Jan. Uh, you know, she had completely fallen out of favour, it seemed, at that point. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose a dead artist is, you know, not there to promote themselves. Uh, and, she and she died so young. Anyway. Pardon? And she wouldn't have probably promoted herself anyway. <laughs> No, I mean, I think she knew what had to be done, though, and she had a, a good gallery in London. She had uh, a good gallery in Edinburgh. Uh, so they, you know, she worked with them and she was very conscientious about presenting her work and getting everything done on time. And, you know, she she had that energy, she had that focus. So um, it, it, the fact she died at the age of 42, you know, really sort of, uh, it was just so sad. She was just beginning to be recognised. And, you know, what work is with is an amazing amount of collections. It's in the National Trust collection, it's in the government art collection. You know, that it was noticed when, you know, as she was, you know, dying really, that was when she was beginning to come to real notice of a wider audience. Mm -hmm. um, Susanna, uh, you, particularly Jenny had made uh, some of the comparisons between uh, what she was doing in Aaron and what she was doing much later in Italy, the form of the old people. That idea of somebody, uh, wanting this not a kind of talisman person but you know Jeannie obviously was a, a figure that was very very important in her life. Yeah I think what's really nice about it is that when you see the photographs you can you can see um, the point that Cordelia Oliver another classmate of Erdley and a big champion of her work was saying that there was a real um, friendship there um, they had obviously enjoyed one another's company um, and, and a very kind of distinctive looking um, old woman um, and I think uh, that there is a real kind of um, sympathy and uh, interest in elderly people, as Jenny pointed out, even though she's most known for her pictures of children in Townhead. Uh, so it's this other kind of huge body of work of elderly people in Italy, in France, in Scotland, um, that we can see when we look at some of the earlier works from the 40s and the early 50s. I think it's a really interesting and perhaps slightly overlooked um, aspect of, of Edley's figurative work. And it's Kelso, it's Jenny Kelso, isn't it? Kelso's an Aaron name. I imagine that there are lots of uh, Jeannie's 
grandchildren actually and great grandchildren that are still on Aaron and it'd be it'd be really interesting to find who, what everybody else's memories are if they have them of uh, Eardley and the Kelso family at, 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 at that time. Um, Heroica Theatre Company, um, there's a Kelso there, Sue Kelso Ryan to everybody Kelso, uh, um, would would you, I mean I'm just putting this out there, would you, it was a great promenade play, you did it and it, you set up it as if it was in art galleries and studios and you walked around with the audience, I mean it, is there a plan uh, to put it on an Aaron? Uh, well, we already have, Kirsty. In fact, um, Aaron was what you might call our premier venue after the National Galleries of Scotland. Uh, we went straight from Modern to, um, to Aaron Village, Corrie Village Hall, which was absolutely lovely. And I would imagine we saw most of the community there that night. Um, and yeah, it was and great Bruce, Bruce, because and Bruce is was brilliant. Yes, <laughs> but would you, but would you do that again for the? For, would you do that again for the, if it was allowed? I mean, obviously, COVID like, for this, um, in a sense, this uh, early one hundred funds permitting. It is. It's quite an expensive venture to remount a, a professional production, but of course, would be most delighted if anybody could help us <laughs> <laughs> in any way. We would seriously would because we don't think we're finished with her yet. We began in two thousand and seven. We worked through with Marilyn to 2017. We're quite convinced that our work with her is not over yet. And, and in fact, when you say your work with her is not over yet, uh, the work as far as this play as it stands now, or do you think that we are finding out things about Early all the time and also finding work that we didn't know before that would actually develop your play even further? Well, I would say in response to that, that the, the thing about a play is that it is essentially drama. Yeah. And we were giving insights that facts and figures and statistics and, and hard fact paintings, for example, don't necessarily give. We were, we were sticking our necks out and going over the parapet and saying we're hypothesizing here with the strength of evidence um, and going into the dramatic. So perhaps I feel we... If there were more um, locations that came to light, which obviously there won't, that might be different. But I think if there are more works, would mm. probably not affect what we've already written and produced. And I wonder how much you think her sexuality affected her work and her life. Hugely, I think. I think uh, that kind of energy where I think she was one of the, she was unapologetic about who she was, but it's not the sort of thing that she could openly talk about and she wasn't that sort of person anyway and I just think that um, she was obviously a very loving human being uh, and that spread itself everywhere and I think that's it's no accident that she was very at home painting children and older people because there, there's no sexual element there there's no her there's a there's a sort of complete freedom to look and accept and exchange love um, and her relationships with Audrey, her deep, deep loving friendships with lots of her female friends and her relationship with Margot, you know, they're, they're all ones which I think fed an, that inner energy that you see in the paintings, which is the way of expressing the power of her passion. Yeah, and he um, said, um, I believe, and I can't remember if this is from the play or the film, I believe the emotion you get from what you're seeing shows what you feel about certain things. And I think I'm quoting that correctly yeah. but she I think that's so interesting because you know the idea was that she was also a thinking painter yeah I think and she was widely read um you know I, I can imagine I'd her list of books we started sort of thinking oh let's see if we can as an actor you know you think let, let's try and get inside what she was reading you just couldn't possibly encompass it um she read so widely and loved her um novels as well but they were serious serious books and she loved jazz you know she was the, the kind of the idea of something that was a bit different was always an appeal to her I think and something that was new and unique attracted her and that what well, it made her attractive just because if of that. If I could add one small thing there about her sexuality um we had a meeting with Christopher Andre who as you probably know wrote a, a fascinating and illuminating biography of Joan Eardley and he showed us various letters he had in his possession. And it was quite clear that 
in an era when we ourselves, for example, would not have been able to admit to ourselves what we were because of the social pressures on us to be otherwise and go elsewhere with our lives. She was very self-aware and unashamed, un unashamedly able to say what she was mm -hmm. and where her affections lay. And that's a, a lesson to all of us. That was the 1950s for heaven's sake. That was extraordinary. And also funnily enough, I've just been doing an interview about Edwin Morgan who didn't feel confident about talking about her very late in his life. You know, it was it was a particular thing in Scotland that well, maybe elsewhere as well, that it was very, very difficult. But it's interesting that she was very assured in her friendships and her relationships. And what did your mum, because she was younger than uh, uh, Joan, tell me about your mum, what she talked about about her sister. Well, um, well, one thing she said was she was always drawing from an early age. You know, as a child, she was always drawing. Um, and I think, yes, yeah, quite, quite quiet, but it, she always, you know, her friendships were important. Now, they grew up basically um, in, in a, an all-female household. Uh, when they lived in, in London, it was um, uh, Joan, uh, my mother, and uh, their mother moved back to their grandmother's house. Um, and at that point, there was there would have been um, her uh, mother and her mother's sister as well. Now, Sybil Morrison, uh, Joan's aunt, uh, she was also a lesbian suffragette and peace campaigner, a very strong and um, opinionated and very opinionated. I remember um, when she came to visit uh, woman, and it, it you have to realise it was very strong. They were all very strong women. So Joan grew up in this sort of, um, you know, strong and stood their ground in difficult times. I mean, her sexuality was just not talked about. But I think that's because in the, the, the 60s and 60s, you just didn't, it wasn't talked about. It was just kind of kept quiet. Um, so, you know, that, that's, um, yeah, yeah. But yes, I mean, I think... Uh, it was only when I was at art school, I think, uh, I, I knew for definite, exactly. I, because Angus was always around, so, you know, there, there, was, there was always a male sort of hanging about in the background. Angus, so tell was... me about Angus. Sorry, I can't hear you. Angus, tell me about Angus. Angus Neal, um, who she painted um, and knew from a uh, hospital field uh, when they were, they were both there uh, as students. And he had a studio in Glasgow in Turnhead as well. And that, he, he was the one that she painted as, as the nude that caused all the, all, yeah. all the furore um, and the, things. Was he, model, was he the model for the, lo the wonderful image of the young man lying back who is who's in essentially the red sand, he's, he's, he's pink and he's in the, he's in the landscape. In, in the Aaron one, I don't know whether it is um, okay. Angus. I don't know, she wouldn't, have, she wouldn't have known Angus at that point, I don't. Yeah. Well, I, it, it's difficult to know. I think that's probably earlier before she, um, yeah. uh, I, I, I've, not, I've not heard that Angus ever went to uh, Aaron with them, but, uh, so that, that would be somebody else. Um, um, Jan Patience, uh, just what um, um, Anne uh, and Alexandra are saying about her voracious appetite for books, that she was always you know, listening to new music, finding new novels. I mean, it's interesting because uh, uh, she was probably a pretty intellectual force as well. I mean, she probably wore it lightly, but she was probably an intellectual force. Yeah, and I think as Anne was saying there, it was a sort of quite a, a a sort of bookish music, uh, you know, articulate household, looking always looking for the, what was happening in the news, and you know, sort of, uh, yeah, I think she was she was always drawn to to, to circles where it was artistic circles, obviously, because she, you know, she that's who she was, but uh, she was always seeking out new people, the likes of Yankel Adler and Joseph Herman when they were in Glasgow. These were Polish emigre artists, you know, she she was drawn to them too, you know, because she wanted to know about what life outside, you know, she was just, yeah, and, and absorbed by music as well. Um, Suzanne Thompson, you get the, the sense of, of an enormous curiosity um, 
and and though yet yeah, when I when I see images of her, you see pictures of her, she seems. I mean, she's quite a strong person, but she seems quite reticent. But maybe that's completely wrong. I think um, Je some of Jenny's research um, and, and in the, a lot of the biographical material, we'd know that she was quite a shy person, uh, especially when she was a younger woman. Um, like, it's on record that she was quite, quite shy, quite um, self-deprecating, modest, uh, unassuming, um, even though she had real kind of physical presence. Um, but I think the, the kind of uh, prolific letter writing does detail this intellectual life, ideas, um, yeah. references to, to cultural events, exhibitions, books that she'd been reading. Um, these very close friendships, I think, really nurtured and fostered that kind of intellectual life uh, discussion, you know, sharing ideas, discussing things. Um, it was a very tight knit community at Basel School of Art in that period. Yeah. So it's a very reduced. Um, um, cohort because lots of students are away for the war. Yes, yeah, so it's a, a small group, uh, largely women, um, and I think it developed this unusually close uh, and supportive, um, largely female network of peers and friends that really sustained that type of intellectual debate. Um, and the letters are a great testament to that. There's so much uh, rich kind of detail in them. And are we going to see the letters during the early 100? Um, I'm not sure about that because they're, they're mostly in the National Gallery's archive. Um, so, um, and yeah, her writing is, um, <laughs> they take a bit of reading. <laughs> um, so it, I, I, I don't think they, they but a, a lot of them have been, um, you know, pieces have been taken uh, that have been written into the books. And uh, Patrick Elliott has uh, just written another book on uh, Catiline and Joan, mm -hmm. um, which will be published later in this in in the in the summer sometime. It's not quite mm -hmm. ready for publication yet. Uh, and finally, Jan, just in terms of Aaron, Aaron Heritage Trail, um, obviously early been bigged up very much. Hopefully this year because of particularly of early one hundred. Uh, what do you hope Aaron will benefit from this? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, the fact that the, this trail exists is just fantastic because people are going to come and, and look at it with fresh eyes. It's like peeling the scales away and seeing the, the art and the artists that were inspired by Aaron. It's wonderful. I, I thought I knew Aaron, but obviously I don't. And I even went to Corrie as a teenager with the school and I didn't know about Joan Early and it was an art week. <laughs> <laughs> I think on that note, uh, um, I'm going to thank you all very much for taking part.